Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch. So today we're going to talk about gearing, uh, pinions and gears, how to change them, some rules of thumb about uh, ways that you can save time and money when you change them. We're going to talk about all the different kinds of gearing and why your differential in your car is the way it is. A high point gear, and I'm going to get into the details of this, is the most complex at least one of the most complex, it probably is the most complex gear to make for a whole bunch of reasons. And when you just look at it, you can see why pretty much. And here's the difference when you want to go from a 273 to a 488. This is the 488 gear out of my Z28 Camaro. I put it in in 1969 and when I bought it back in 2015, it was still in the car. I took it out and I put a 355 in it. I'm going to tell you why that's a good number to use. And this is the 273 gear out of Mike's uh, GTO. And today we're going to install a 355 gear, which is a good street gear. And we'll talk about that as well. And there's the difference between, uh, as you get ratio number goes up numerically, the pinion gets smaller and has less teeth. And while I'm on that subject, uh, you'll notice that a gear ratio is never even. It's always 4.88, it's never five, it's never four, never three, never two. Because there's a theory, and not this theory, a practice, a thing called a hunting tooth. So if you multiply, if you're on a four to one rear end, if there's 10 teeth in the pinion, and you have 40 in the gear, then the same teeth are gonna contact the same teeth every time they go around. So that's not a good thing. So there's always one extra tooth. So if they put uh, 41 teeth in the gear and four in the pinion, you got a 410 rear end, right? And so as it rotates, the pinion and teeth never match, never see the same teeth again, except after multiple times. This little uh, thing to add in. Before I get going, a um, couple of things I got to cover from the past. One is, here's uh, Roland's, Used to be Mike's budget build. Now this is Roland's engine, reborn. We are going to dyno this engine as soon as we get a dyno date, probably going to be early January. And it's a beautiful piece of art, it's dredge art. And I put Roland's heads on it. We fixed Roland's heads. I got to point out one thing. I mentioned all the things that were wrong about the ad on Roland's heads versus what he bought. They're fixed now, they're good to go. One of the things I didn't cover the ad said it had stainless steel valves, and it does have stainless steel valves. So to be fair to the seller, uh, that part was true. I didn't mention that. Before I keep going, please like and subscribe. I got a tip of the day at the end of the video for you. And if you hang in with me, it's not going to be too long. We try to give you as much information as quickly as we can, save you time. And we're going to cover that off at the end. I have a tip of the day about how you can be more efficient when you're doing work. So one of the other things from previous video, I talked about uh, uh, stock car engines banging off the chip. And I mentioned that a number of times that uh, we turn those, uh, our, the uh, sorry, 604 engines up to 6,200 RPM and bang them off the chip. What the heck is the chip? So that's a chip. So Every race car has a some kind of computer control of the maximum RPM. And how they do that, there's a, you know, they use have an MSD box. So this little component plugs into the box and that limits the RPM. So when you get to the, if in this case, it's a 7,800 RPM chip out of our super late model car. That's how much RPM we turn with them. And uh, when it gets to 7,800, the computer says only every second spark plug is going to fire. So if you've been at a race and you see when the cars get near the start finish line, they start sounding terrible like they're missing. They are missing. Every second spark plug is not firing. And that limits the acceleration. The engine cannot accelerate, but it can stay at that RPM uh, as long as they want. So the drivers typically hit that chip, keep your foot on the throttle until they're ready to start braking. And getting that part right is a big, big part of uh, efficiency of a race engine, racing car. So I want to cover that off. Sometimes I mention things. I assume everybody knows what I'm talking about. And sometimes uh, uh, that's not correct. So I covered that off. So 
Today we're going to talk about gearing. Uh, first of all, when we do Will's gear, we've already got it apart and we've got uh, one of the issues that we have is when you take it apart, uh, his original gear is this one, the 273, and there's a shim that goes in behind. Sorry, I dropped it around. Here it is. Goes in here, and it, the, the bearing goes on top of that. And you need to know, even if you're not going to use that shim, you need to know how thick that shim is. And here's the reason why. The gearing is basically so well precision machine that the gearing's interchangeable. The use of shims in a housing is to make up for the differences in the in machining of the housing, the casting of the housing, etc. So that shim, this shim on the front of your pinion determines the depth of your pinion. And the depth of your pinion is the first critical thing you need to determine when you're installing uh, new gears. And so to start off with, you measure that shim and either use this shim or another shim or pack of shims equal this, I think, 32 thousandths of an inch, something like that. And that's typical. And so if you remove gears, if I, and I talk about the old days, and that's true, and the, these cars were new in the 60s and 70s, I changed lots of gears. And it was pretty common, pull it apart. We never ever changed bearings. Let me talk about that. The bearings in your rear end are designed to last forever. As long as you keep oil in them and don't do some crazy thing to abuse them, they will last forever. Changing bearings is not a bad thing. Most of the time you don't have to. Back in the 60s and 70s, we never changed bearings. We got that, the front bearing off the pinion to measure the shim, and we use the same bearing. Usually put the same shims back in. And to locate the rear, the, the differential, the, this part of the differential, the carrier and the gear part, is another set of shims. And I'm going to grab those. We actually broke one when we took it out, but that doesn't matter. Uh, back in the day, we, it was common to uh, reuse these cast iron shims. We got away with it most of the time. Because the gearing is so precise, if you reuse the original pinion shim and the original gear shims, or shims equal to the thickness, obviously this one's broken, but we can measure it. We have measured it and use shims equal to the same thickness you will probably be pretty close to get started. Now we'll, we'll verify all that. We'll do the painting of the teeth and the gear to get a good pattern and all that stuff. We'll do all that stuff. But 90% of the time when you change gear ratios, uh, and once again, often we would pop them out, replace this, you reuse the same shim, reuse the same bearings, stick these guys back in when the when the factory puts them together what they do is spread their end apart uh, hydraulically and then the shims can just fall into place and uh, so we got to hammer them in or tap them in at least so that's how we do it and uh, we'll, we'll have more about this when we get it going but and this is not a how-to video on all details about changing the rear end but those are some tips that you might find uh, helpful so so gearing, what, let's talk about gearing so we have a kind of an understanding of how gears work. And I'm going to get into how to pick the right gear ratio for your hot rod. Give you some rules of thumb or guidelines that I think might be helpful. Because that's one of the big questions when people want to update the performance of their car. Typically, OEM cars come off with the, the gearing ratio in mind was based on economy and they assume the engine in the car has got to last 100,000 miles and people are going to be driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour. So gear ratios typically in the standard car, if it was on a hot rod, would be 273, 308, maybe 323, depending on what it is. If you want a performance car, you need to be 355, 373, maybe even more. I'll talk about that in more detail. But let's start, try to get an understanding of gears, first of all. So, uh, I made a little diagram here and then Mike came along and fixed it for me because I'm not very good at writing. So uh, took my ideas and cleaned it up for you. So first of all, a spur gear is where that's the pinion and that's the gear. And the spur teeth and the gear teeth are parallel to the center line. That's the simplest and most economical gear. 
It's typically not used in anything automotive or high speed or precise because as the gear and pinion rotate, there is a time where there's a clearance between the pinion teeth and the gear teeth. So they're typically a lot noisier. Uh, so the ratio of the gear is just the ratio of the number of teeth in the pinion divided by the number of teeth in the gear. So uh, a 410 rin has got, uh, this as an example, I'm making this up, 10 teeth in the pinion and 41 teeth in the gear. Okay, so, but you'll never see that in an automotive application. Helical gears, you will. If you have a four-speed transmission in your car uh, or any, now automatics have sun gears. That's another subject. We'll talk about that maybe someday. But uh, helical gears in the transmission, and that's how you get your ratios, where the teeth are cut at an angle. And as the gear rotates, the benefit of that is you always have more than one tooth engaged at a time. So you never have this clearance clacking sound. It's a lot smoother uh, and it's a lot stronger. Obviously, the gear tooth, if you have the same width and it's cut at an angle, the tooth's going to actually be longer. So that's going to make it stronger as well. So that's typical. One of the problems with uh, helical gears is because you have an angle, you create a thrust. So as the two gears are turning, they try to separate from each other. One tries to go one way, one tries to go the other way. So you need uh, bigger thrust bearings in your transmission. Whereas in a spur gear, you don't need very big uh, uh, bearings in the trans thrust gears and thrust bearings in the transmission. So, so the next type of gear is a miter gear. And that's where the center line of the pinion and the center line of the gear are at right angles to each other. Okay. So uh, typically uh, a differential in the car is kind of a miter gear. We'll get to that. So one's going this direction, one's going this direction, and that's how you change direction. We tried to show that by showing the, the pinion at one angle and the gear at the other angle. So the pinion's coming in and the gear's going in a different direction. And this would be a helical uh, pinion gear. It's helical as well. So that's uh, a, diff a miter gear, basically. So now we're down to a high point. So a high point, once again, is the most complex a uh, gear that there pretty much is. It's one of the most difficult to machine. It's very complicated to machine it. And here's why. And the difference is it's not only uh, a bevel gear, it's also called a bevel gear or a miter gear. It's not only beveled and angled, but the center line of the pinion is on a different center line than the gear is. So in differential of your car, the pinion is usually at the very bottom or close to the bottom of the of the uh, of the uh, 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 housing and not on the center line. So why is that? It's that because that's how you get your car down on the ground. If you had to have it on the center line, the car would have to have a much bigger ride height. You have to have a, a pinion angle uh, between your drive shaft and your transmission, usually around four degrees. So why is that? If because it's a universal uh coupling that we use with little uh, needle uh, bearings if you didn't have an angle <clears throat> those little needle bearings would never rotate you'd be pounding on the same place all the time so the four degrees of angle change gets the bearings in the in the uh, uh, universal joints using the right name finally in the universal joints turning so you need that four degrees it also has a lot of other factors as well but Getting back to it, a high point gear is a combination of a miter gear and a helical gear combined. And thus, I already showed this, look how complicated those teeth are to machine. They're not simple and there's a whole machining process. I'm not a machining expert, uh, but uh, that certainly gives you an idea how complicated it is. I have, I have seen these, this done before. So, uh, so the differential in your car, almost every car, is a high point gear. And that's why setting them up and getting them adjusted right, using getting the right contact pattern, etc., is critical. And that's what we're going to do today with Mike and I. We're going to get, uh, once again, he took a 273 gear out. This is his new carrier uh, with positive traction, of course, and new gear. And we're going to go to a 355 gear. Uh, what we're going to do today 
is that's the original bearing. So we're going to clean that bearing out. That bearing was pressed on or difficult to get off. We're going to clean this bearing. We're not going to reuse this bearing. Mike bought all new bearings. Reuse this bearing so we can slide this bearing on Mike's pinion and do our trial and error until we get it right, until we get the pinion depth correct. And when that's all done, we will take that bearing off. We'll use the spacer to start with. We'll take that bearing off and put on the new bearing and put it in for good and preload it. And now we're getting into the details of our, of our pinion insulation. And we're not able to do that right now for you today. So um, there's lots of good videos, by the way, about how to get the right contact pattern, how to get the right preload, etc. So if you're going to do that kind of a job, uh, I'd check it out. So a couple things that uh, people talk about. Uh, M21 versus M22 Muncie transmission. So the M M21 is typically the transmission that comes in Z28s. Uh, it's a close ratio transmission. It only has 2.2 first gear versus an M20, M20, which is 2.52, I think, first gear. Uh, and why do you use an M21 close ratio? Because Z28s were intended to be road racing cars. And the M20, uh, 220 first gear is not a first gear to get you going off the line. They didn't care. They're taking the flag at 5,000 RPM. They never had to come off the line. So what they wanted to have is first gear is 220, <clears throat> fourth gear is one to one. The closer those numbers are together, the closer the ratios are between each other, the less RPM drop every time the, the driver shifts the car. That's why you want close ratio transmissions. So all Z28s or most all Z28s came with M21s. And later they come out with an M22. So what's an M22? It's the same ratios as an M21. They call them rock crushers because that's what they sound like. They're very noisy. They almost sound like uh, the kind of noise a blower makes or if you use uh, timing gears, solid timing gears with instead of a chain, uh, you'll get kind of the same sound. And why do they sound that way? Because we go back to the uh, idea of a helical gear, the, the, different, the angle of the tooth is what makes them nice and smooth and quiet. So uh, because they use them in road racing, they didn't want that thrust to be so high, so they lessened the angle of the helix between the two gears, and that reduced the thrust. But because the angle's less, you've got less teeth engaged with each other and the gears are noisier. So that's why a rock crusher is noisier than a M21. Uh, but is an M22, M21 the best gear to come off the line? I'm going to talk about that in a minute and come back to it. So a um, couple more things, 12 bolt versus 10 bolt. So everybody wants a 12 bolt wrench. So where did 12 bolt wrench come? So uh, GM put 12 bolt wrens in Z28s and in big blocks, typically the high performance big blocks, the, the L78 and L88, and those cars like that. And my Z28 has one. I'm happy it has one. Do I need a 12 bolt wren on the street? No, you don't. A uh, 10 bolt wren, if you're driving on the street, the limitation of your torque that gets to the rear wheels it gets to the ground is not how much torque you got in your engine. You can have 600 foot pounds in your engine. If your tires start spinning when you're at 400 foot pounds, that's how much torque your engine is going to make. And that's how much the track, the, the rear end is going to see. So for a street car, a 10 bolt rear end is just fine. It's cool to have a 12 bolt. I'm glad I have one, but you don't need one for a street car. Uh, typically. Now, if you're going to take to the drag strip and put 14 inch wide slicks on it, and launch it at 5,000 RPM might be a nice thing to have, but otherwise you don't need it. A Ford 9 inch, what's a Ford 9 inch? A Ford 9 inch is the ultimate strongest gear. Uh, Mopar also makes a Dana that's pretty strong, it's used in drag racing, but pretty much all quick change rear ends are built around a Ford 9 inch. Uh, a lot, almost all drag cars use a Ford 9 inch because it is a heavy duty service. Obviously, if you're launching a drag car, you know, at high RPM with good slicks that you are going to transport your torque. So four nine inch is the ultimate. Uh, and there's lots of retrofits and versions of four nine inch. 
even our stock car that we use, super stock stock car that only makes 375 horsepower or so, uses a 49 inch. The other difference is we're doing that all day long, like as opposed to driving it on the street. So, so I'll cover a few things off there. So the next one thing to cover is what gear ratio do you, do you need to use? And that's a big question for everybody. What's the right gear ratio? So uh, I have a, a rule of thumb here. I'm going to show it in a second. I better get talk about it a little bit first. So first you've got to decide how you're going to drive your car. If you're going to drive down the interstate, you know, back and forth from Canada to Florida all the time, then you probably want a numerically low gear ratio because you don't want your RPM turning up too high. Uh, if you're going to, the way I use my Z28, once in a while we, on a weekend, we go to the beach, which is 45 minutes away. Most of the time we're going 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, maybe a little more once in a while. I pick a 355 gear. A 355 gear with a 28 inch tire will give you 60 miles an hour at 3000 RPM. And unless you've got an overdrive transmission, which I don't, I have a four-speed transmission, that's a nice gear. Now, uh, my Z28 came with an M21, M22, sorry, M21 transmission. I still have it. It's down in my basement being preserved. And I got an M20 transmission because in the car, because it's 2.52 first gear. And combined with the 355 uh, final drive ratio, that gives me a torque multiplication factor of about eight, just under eight, and that's a lot better. So uh, Z28s all came with at least 373 gears in the rear end. Because they had close ratio transmission, you absolutely have to have that higher numerical gear in your rear end, and that really wasn't enough. They still don't, didn't have a good torque multiplication. They weren't fast off the line, and how do you make them fast off the line? you put a 48 gear in, which is what I put in my Z28 about two weeks after I bought it. So um, that's the only make those inches work. They don't have a lot of torque and they got to have RPM to make them work. So, so ideally some rules of thumb for you, if you're designing your hot rod, first of all, the, the way you're going to drive it and then the weight of the car uh, versus the size of the engine is a big factor. So typically, uh, if you want a nice performing hot rod on the street, you shouldn't have more than 10 pounds of car per uh, foot pounds of torque in the engine. That's a rule of thumb. It's subjective, but that's kind of what I go by. And then for torque multiplication, overall, if you multiply your first gear ratio times your final drive ratio, your differential ratio, it should be at least eight to one. Uh, eight to one to 12 to one is in a nice range. So a nice combination, if you have a, a 350 small block, uh, one of the, and I'm going to show this, uh, Gary's Nova, uh, 373 rear end with a 700 R4 transmission, which has got 306 first gear. You have a torque multiplication 11 point something, and that makes a nice performing hot rod. Now, if you don't have overdrive in your transmission, you got to think about that as well. One of the other factors is, what size is your engine? So, for example, a Z28 engine running at 6,000 RPM, the piston is going the same speed as the, the Z28 with the 302, sorry, that's going at 6,000 RPM, compared to a 350 engine that's going, uh, is, is the same RPM as a 350 going 5147 or 5150. So, Ultimately, you want to design for your piston speed. So if you have a big block with a four and a half inch stroke, you don't need as much gear ratio because you got so much more torque and you don't want as much gear ratio because your piston is going to be going that much faster. It's strictly a ratio of the stroke. So 350, you take 6,000 RPM multiplied by 302 divided by 350 and you're going to get yourself 5150 RPM. So Take that into consideration. How big is your engine? How long is your stroke? How are you going to drive it? If you want to drive down the interstate at 90 miles an hour all the time, then you got a gear for that. If you're going to take it to the beach every Sunday at uh, 60 miles an hour most of the time, then you can put lots of gear ratio in it and have lots of fun with it. So those are some guidelines. So I want to give you an example of that. 
So if I was to ask you what you think would be fastest, a 427 El Camino with 500 foot-pounds of torque or 355 Nova with 390 foot-pounds of torque, which one would be fastest? So I'm going to give you a, put a screenshot in. I'm going to hold it up here. Mike's going to put a screenshot of this diagram, uh, this uh, spreadsheet uh, into the video. So here's how it works. I know both of these cars. I built both the engines and I installed both these engines. So Dave's 427 El Camino is 432 cubic inches, 400 and actually 79 horsepower. I said 500, it was actually 499 foot-pounds of torque on the dyno. <clears throat> so when I did this, when I installed it, he had a, just a 350 turbo hydromatic transmission, 2.52 first gear, and it had a 308 differential rear end in it. So the torque multiplication is only 7.76. I said you want at least eight to one round numbers, higher the better. So the torque at the rear wheels for Dave's El Camino is 3,873 foot pounds. Going back to Gary's 355, it's only 358 cubic inch, uh, uh, horsepower, 391 foot pounds. It's torque that matters guys, not horsepower, okay? Torque is the most important part measurement to use. So Gary's got a 700 R4 transmission, 306 first gear, 373 final drive. Gary's torque multiplication is 11.4 to one. So Gary's got 4,463 foot-pounds of torque at the, at the tire uh, versus uh, Dave's El Camino's got 3,873 foot-pounds of torque at the tire. So which one's gonna accelerate faster? Probably the one that's going to break the tires loose is going to, going to lose. But as long as they have traction, uh, Gary's 350, little 350, is going to out-accelerate Dave's 427. Now, for what it's worth, since I've installed that, uh, Dave's already installed a 373 gear in his 427. And I'm not sure if he's got it done yet, but he's in the process of installing a 700R4. That is, if you have an automatic for a street hot rod, that would be my ideal setup. 700R4, if you can get one, and 373 gear is a perfect setup. You still got, you still got your overdrive at uh, high speed. Okay, a couple other points that I didn't mention. So, uh, first of all, the differential we're working on uh, that's going to go in Mike's GTO is out of a Le Mans, not a GTO. Otherwise, they're the same. But the Le Mans is what comes with the 273 uh, gear ratio, rear end ratio, and the GTO would have come with 355. Mike has that gear, but this housing was in better condition, and by the time it's all done, it's going to be the same thing, and we'll have a 355 gear in it as well. So one of the other things is if you're hot, out, right, upgrading your differential and you have a hot rod, if you don't have positive traction, uh, it's one of the things we did here as well. So the original carrier had a normal differential and the idea of that is that as you go around a corner the left and right wheels can turn uh, different speeds so that you don't have uh, a lot of friction going around a corner so mike replaced that with a uh, a positive traction uh, device there's a number of them available uh, on the market uh, to do that and what it does is you still have a differential but it's a lot harder for the left and right wheels to turn different speeds. Uh, but they still can when you're, if you're turning a tight corner, they still can, but it's a lot harder for them to do that. And that's what gives you better traction. So if you don't have some kind of a positive traction differential and you've got lots of horsepower and lots of torque, you're going to probably have your uh, left wheel spinning a lot because the torque reaction goes to your right wheel and lifts the left one off the ground and your left tire is just going to spin and the right one's not going to even be driving the car. So if you want to get going, you need to have a positive traction end of some kind. And if you have any kind of power where you're going to be using it that way, it's definitely a, almost a necessary upgrade to do. So cover that off. And then um, choosing your ratio. I think I covered that off. Any questions about that? Just some guidelines, it's not a total story about it. And so the tip of the day, let me get to that. 
is to be efficient, you need to stay organized. And uh, it may sound redundant to say that, but I think it's important. I see lots of examples where that's not the case. Not everybody has a dream garage with every tool that you need to have and all the resources necessary, but that's okay. You can still make the best of the space you have. First of all, you gotta plan the job, make a budget, uh, plan, plan the job in detail, but then before you start, and maybe not a big good time to say it, but some people say, what do you like to have on your bench? Nothing when I start, nothing. And if I get going and I can't find one tool, I put every tool back in the box. And before I get them all back in there, I'm gonna find the one that I'm missing. Stay organized, be methodical. The other thing is when I'm working, I usually by myself and that's fine. That's the way I like to work. I have the Beach Boys or the Eagles or Johnny Cash somewhere in the, back, in the background keeping me company. But if I get to something important, let's say taking uh, uh, bearing measurements to measure bearing clearances where you need to be uh, very, very uh, precise and concentrated, I turn all that off. Somebody shows up to visit, you put down the tools and do not do any work while you're visiting because you'll make a mistake for sure. Uh, just to give an example, I remember years and years ago, my Z28, put it all together, short block all together. And I woke up in the morning, I couldn't remember torquing the main bearing bolts. So I took the oil pan off and retorqued them. That was really, yeah, they were torqued, but I couldn't remember doing it. So if you do it methodically, write stuff down. When you do important things, keep a little notepad, like just a simple deal like this and a pen, uh, write down the date you did it. I did an important step today. As you can see, if you watch my videos, I document every bearing clearance, every measurement that I take it goes on an Excel spreadsheet. But if you write down stuff, you'll remember it. If you take, say we're doing spring heights on 16 valves, and you think you're gonna remember all that when you get done, I guarantee you won't. So if you write it down, you don't have to worry about remembering it. So stay organized, be efficient, try to avoid mistakes. I mean disasters can happen if you forget to follow a step properly. So that's my tip for today. Okay, before I forget, please like and subscribe before we close off. What's coming up? I mentioned Will's engine at the beginning. Uh, as soon as we get those pistons, we ordered pistons to give us a better quench height. And I should have them here this week. And this would be my focus, getting this together. So we'll have lots of videos about this process, installing the cam bearings, and completing this engine. Uh, we have a dyno date book for December the 10th right now. And that's the plan. It'll be running and ready for the dyno. I'll have videos on my test stand. So another thing, uh, Mike has created playlists for me. So if you're on my channel and you're interested in a certain subject, whether it's you know, camshafts or gear ratios or whatever it is, uh, you can go to the playlist and it'll give you all the videos lined up on that same subject. Uh, budget builds is one of them, for example, and there's others, and that'll help you to, there's lots of good videos I made in the past that are kind of buried back there. If you want to see them again, if you're interested in the budget build from the day one, uh, that'll give you uh, all the details for that. So thank you very much for watching. Make my day. Please like and subscribe.